We have one here on the south side, which opened in 2009. We have one on the west side that's in Oak Park that services the 15th and 25 police districts. And then we have someone central that's at the UIC. And there's a couple things we all have in common. One is we're all in places that require us to pay no rent because we don't have money, and so we have agreements with places where we pay no rent. And we also have creative people assigned to each and every one of those offices. Creative because while we do prosecute cases, our other two missions are really, really important as we step out of our roles as traditional prosecutors, and that is to do problem solving and prevention programs. And prevention programs can run the gamut from going to elementary schools and teaching kids about cyberbullying, sexting, and those kinds of things that when I was growing up, we didn't even have a computer in school. We had the Texas Instruments, you know, little things, five times seven is 35. That was a computer for me growing up because I'm old. Um, we've gone from there to we have programs for seniors to teach them about scams that people target them for as seniors. So we run the gamut for prevention programs. That's not it. We do problem solving. Because solving problems is more than just locking people up in jail, which is why you're here today, which is why the South Side is holding this seminar today for all of you to be here. It's thinking outside of the box. Because if you aren't creative, if you're not willing to think outside of the box, if you're not willing to try other ways to solve traditional problems in crime prevention, then you shouldn't be in one of the community justice centers that we have. And so it's with a great deal of pride that I'm, I'm able to be here with everyone today, watch Kathy be up here that, like I said, I've known her since she's about nine and we were partners together, and welcome you here to help work with us to think outside the box and problem solve and work with other ways of bringing restoration to our victims as well as helping our offenders to become a part of our greater community. So I want to welcome you here and I hope you have a fantastic day. Thank you all for coming. relationships in the community where we live, work, play, and serve. And so we were blessed to be in the community with Chicago State University, who graciously offered us this space so that we could host this restorative justice uh, expo. And so uh, Dr. Troy Hardin is going to welcome us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to welcome everybody here to Chicago State. Um, as Kathy mentioned, my name is Troy Hart. I am a professor here in the Department of Social Work uh, at Chicago State, but I'm also the director of the Institute of, for Youth and Community Engagement. And just a little quick piece about the Institute for Youth and Community Engagement. It's a new entity here at Chicago State. It was started uh, in an effort to really uh, deepen uh, the relationship between the university and the larger community. And we thought that there's no better way to start that uh, by, by instituting uh, a very strong discipline around restorative practices. And so when Kathy approached us about the opportunity to host this event here, we thought it fit very well with our mission and where we're headed in our work. One of the things that we do in the Institute is we have a, a, a program and a project for young people called Truth and Trauma. And so our young people meet here uh, at Chicago State on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays, actually. And you'll get to meet a couple of those young people today. But one of the things we do is we sit in circle uh, before we start anything and during and after. And we, we have a really strong uh, commitment to restorative practices of what we do and what we take out to the community. And on Tuesday, uh, many of the young people walked in and, and were, felt very discouraged by the recent event, the recent loss in our community of a child. And so there was a, a sense of hopelessness in, in the air amongst a lot of the young people. Uh, before the circle was over, uh, some of that hope had been restored. Um, and I won't go into details about how that happened. But that's the power of restoration, that's the power of peace circles, that's the power of the work that we do, is that it's a beacon of life in terms of hope in our community. There are many practices out there, but I believe, and I think we believe, that the work that is being done by the state's attorney's office and others associated with restorative justice in our community is one of those shining lights that will continue to help heal our community, but also push justice in the right direction. So again, I want to really thank you for coming out here. Uh, we welcome you, uh, as they say.
say be casa su casa for the day, you know, and we want to continue to extend our relationship out into the community. Thank you. And now, um, with an introduction to restorative justice, the Honorable Judge Sophia Hall. I've been tasked with talking about what is restorative justice. Now, I know I have some friends here in the room who yeah. I've been working with for the past 10 years. Uh, in my introduction into restorative justice, I've seen, seen one young lady. I don't know if we've worked together, have we? We share hair. <laughs> but you were just saying you've been doing it now for 10 years? 10 years. In yeah. one form or another. One form. I hear that. So those of you who have been familiar with restorative justice and have been working with it uh, for a period of time, um, raise your hand so I can know who I'm talking to. Great, great. Now, and who thinks they really don't know what restorative justice is? Please raise your hand. All right. And I'm going to say to you that even those of us who've been working in restorative justice for 10 years keep learning about the power of restorative justice and what it is. But Kathy said I did what we're supposed to spend 10 years talking to you, so I'm going to give you uh, my five minutes conversation about what restorative justice is. And it starts with Kathy. Kathy and I um, met in a line getting some food over at Juvenile Court. I was a presiding judge of Juvenile Court when she came, uh, was there. I became presiding judge there in 1992. So she was already there when I came. But I didn't get a chance to be in a food line with Kathy until many years later. And as we were standing there and she was talking to me also about her love for restorative justice, we bonded. And we bonded because we had this common passion. And we continued to bond and develop a deeper, trusting relationship because we've worked together. We've been in meetings where we have talked with others, circles, about um, how we can work together in a restorative way. And so it's come to a point where she trusts me, I trust her, and when she said I should come here on a Saturday morning after a terrible week, and I got out of bed going, oh my God, uh, there was just no way that I could not be here because Kathy and I are sisters in this, as you will be and as we have become brothers and sisters in working in restorative justice because by developing this relationship, we come, become family, not just in community, as you will also be as you continue to do this, but also in the work of restorative justice. It's about those relationships and those trusting relationships. So restorative justice is also how do you develop those relationships? How do you do that? That's really hard. And what makes it hard is because you really have to share yourself with the people you wish to come into relationship with. That's really the only way to do it. And when I became a judge, it was kind of a nice place for me because I'm not an easy person to share with. And the uh, wonderful distance between myself and others because of the bench was very, very comfortable for me. What has been a growth for me in restorative justice is because I have been required, since I have been in circle, since I care so much about kids and what we need to do about kids, I've been required to share. And what we share with each other, what we have to share with each other, are the harms that we all have experienced in our lives, the pain that we all suppress in our lives, and we very often don't have an opportunity to share with others. That is the key to developing an open and trusting relationship, accepting the fact that we have all been harmed in some way. And others we come into relationship with have also been harmed in some way. And to go into circle and to share just one of those harms can open the door to 
really meaningful conversation in which you develop uh, those trusting relationships. Because you know you're not different. You're, we are all the same. And after you talk about the harm, you get a chance to talk about what you need to heal. And that's also hard, because sometimes you don't know quite what you need. But one of the things that I think is fundamental to what we need is that we need to share that harm with somebody else who will look at us and say, yes, I understand. Not to be judgmental, not to blame us, but to be able to say, I understand. I might not approve, but it's not a question of anybody approving. <laughs> It's a question of what I need and the harm that's happened. And then, the next step in the restorative process that happens in these rooms, that will happen as we problem solve here. That can happen when the circle is used to address um, victim-offender conversations, is that we have to recognize our obligations to each other. We cannot hold that youth accountable for their offense if we are not willing to hold ourselves accountable for the environment they live in that might have contributed to them committing that offense or having the opportunity to commit yeah. yes. We all are to blame. Getting past the blame, but recognizing our obligations and the ways that we have not satisfied our obligations to each other, then we go to the next healing step. And that is, we work together to figure out our way to address the harms, to fill the needs, and to satisfy our obligations by creating a path, a path toward solutions and toward peace. None of this is static. We cannot say we have accomplished peace. No. Because there will always be events where we fall off our path toward peace. Where we have to come back together and continue together to address what might be something that may happen that we perceive may happen because this will occur or an offense will occur that is a crisis for the community, a breach in the peace, which is a crisis for the community. But in this room today, in this room today and in these rooms, we can start to create that path toward peace. The places where people can go in our community in order to get on that path. You're here today because you are the people here in this community who care about this community, your partners from other communities who have come here to be a part of this community, because you know what you need to create in order to have that path to the church. And I want to assure you that you're not alone. We are having these conversations, these restorative justice expos, all over the county. And your progress, your successes, your facing obstacles, your failures, because you learn from your failures, and which will help you to create an even better path. We want the whole county to be able to see what you've been doing, what other communities are doing, so we can come together in our family of restorative justice and support each other in taking not only this community, but every community in county, and therefore our entire county, in paths toward peace. And that's how we create a restorative justice community in Cook County. And thank you for your participation. Thank you.